Cool. Yeah, we're we're set up. You know, the at least getting to learn the technology here of how to integrate Facebook <laughs> and benefit. And yeah, that definitely is the benefit. I don't. I don't know if we're gonna make this probably a quick a quick little update, but it will be good because we'll talk about. Oh, whoops. One sec. See, I don't know this totally. All right, there we go. We got some. So for those of that are joining on Facebook, if you want to also join on Zoom, you could simply click this link. I am going to put it in, I will put it in the comments section right now okay so if you want to go on facebook then i mean i'm sorry if you want to go to zoom i just added the link there feel free it should be open and it'd be great if you wanted to join this way you could actually ask questions right on the audio and we could see each other as well instead of speaking into a Facebook page of just myself. But the focus, we'll just kind of get things rolling here. The focus of today is just going to be to touch on the uh, pediatric multi-system inflammatory disorder, because I think you're going to hear a lot more of this. Hopefully, hopefully it goes away <laughs> and that, and that it's not part of this COVID-19 syndrome. But my guess is it probably, probably is. You know, here's kind of the, uh, some of the connection here. When you think about the COVID cases, right? So just in adults, think about this, that um, the majority of cases of COVID-19, right, vast majority, are people are either asymptomatic or mildly, mildly symptomatic, okay? And then you have a cohort, a group that are ill enough that they have to go to the hospital, and then a segment of those are ill enough that they need to be admitted to the hospital, right? And a segment of those need to be admitted to the ICU. And then there's just a segment that, that die. Uh, when we look at the most severe cases in adults, what we see is most likely that this is due to severe inflammation. So this is what's really interesting here and how I think you make a pretty logical leap to the, this new multi-system inflammatory disorder in kids. In adults, the severe inflammation was happening um, in main, mainly in the lungs, but systemically as well right? People were having cytokine surges. People are, are in kind of a septic picture, shock-like picture, uh, but it's mainly focused in the lungs and the inflammation uh, in the lungs leading to edema or fluid in the lungs. And if we just kind of take that uh, thought process or the pathophysiology, it can be applied to children. And what's happening in children is that, you know, um, we're seeing an inflammatory condition that is mainly, at least for right now, the big impact is happening in the heart and the vessels, the blood vessels and heart and mucous membranes, it seems like. That's my guess, right? So when, when we piece this all together, um, 
when we think about inflammation, right? These kids with this multi-system inflammatory disorder, they're having things like diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, symptomatic, their symptoms. And a lot of that could be due to inflammation. And when they're in the, ho the hospital, the worst cases in the hospital, uh, they are presenting with myocarditis and shock. So their, their blood vessels aren't responding well. And you'll hear that this condition looks like Kawasaki disease, which is a pretty well-known condition in the pediatric population. Uh, I remember cases, you know, in, during my training, and there's plenty of pediatricians who see cases. That's not uncommon. And it's overall, it's a very unusual condition. And then you're seeing something look like toxic shock syndrome, where uh, you'll remember kind of classic toxic shock syndrome was happening. You probably know it best from uh, women with a particular tampon many decades ago that were uh, being uh, having a bacterial infection and that infection was releasing a toxin and causing a toxin toxic shock-like syndrome. Uh, pretty similar here where these individuals are requiring a lot of fluids and medications in order to keep their blood pressure elevated enough. And so what they're seeing in New York City right now, New Orleans, uh, Mississippi, New Jersey has cases, Michigan has cases, England has cases, a lot of European countries have cases, is this condition that looks like Kawasaki, it looks like toxic shock, it's not either of those, and it's like this brand new condition. And so if I were to kind of just step back here and think about this, if you think about this critically at all, with the same kind of lenses that you would have thought about this new pneumonia in January of this year, I think you end up arriving at the conclusion that this is COVID-19 related. I, I can't, you know, it would be highly unusual for it to be anything else here. Now, time will tell and we're going to uh, have to learn a lot more about this, but what this does is it throws a wrench into a lot of the um, potential uh, interactions we were hoping for that would occur sooner than later, right? Now, what I mean by that is, that if kids are coming down at this with this syndrome, this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, then the um, kind of the risk threshold of putting kids back together uh, or putting kids in groups or in camps or schools, uh, that changes the dynamic there. That changes uh, what I think people are going to, want to do. And here's what's really scary and frightening right now is that no one is paying attention to this in the way it needs to be. And so what the consequence is going to be, and, and what I'm saying here could easily be false in the sense that we just don't know enough uh, and may not happen. And, and I hope that's the case. But because we're not paying enough attention to this right now, that more and more kids are going to have the con have consequences from this. They're going to suffer the effects of this. And, and um, that's going to be hard to, in many ways. So I don't know, there's just so little information on this, but what I can tell you is this walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. And if I were to 
a wager on this right now. Uh, we're dealing with a condition that COVID-19 is not benign to kids. And um, it, it makes sense, right? Because if you think about it, the scientific community was always saying, why doesn't this affect kids, right? Like, it doesn't make sense when we see it happening so severely in adults. Now, diseases have predilections, infectious diseases have predilections for different age groups. We know that 1918 pandemic, flu pandemic, ravaged middle-aged, healthy individuals. It, 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 it affected everyone, uh, but it did have a, a greater predilection for certain groups. In fact, I think it was H1N1 back in 2012-ish, nine or 12, um, that also was impacting kind of middle-aged people more than others. But it affects everyone. And so I, for a word of caution for this group here, I think it's important that before we like what i'm seeing in my community at least is this letting your guard down of kids it's saying you know they really need to get outside which i agree uh, they really need to see their friends which i agree uh, but they still need to physically distance and our responsibility as adults as a parents as people in the community is to be able to enforce that uh, systemically uh, because the sooner, you know, if we could make it a habit now, then summer will be easier. And it's when a disease isn't around you, it's easy to become passive about it because you don't see it. There's no army imposing in on your city, right? Like some play times in history, uh, right? Where you have people on the borders of something. Uh, this is silent and it, it's not invisible. <laughs> it's invisible to the human, to the naked eye, but you see these things in microscopes. Um, uh, the virus will, uh, it's there. It's, it's, it's present. And as we reemerge, whether it's now or whether it's in the fall or whether it's next year, it will be present again. And, um, and we don't want our kids who are vulnerable to this because they don't appreciate the seriousness of this. We, we don't want to put them in, in harm's way here, right? We need to protect them as well. So I guess the takeaway of all this is, you know, on one hand, um, to just be um, mindful that everything that we're doing as adults, we need to think about this in light of our kids, in light of children, not just ours, but all children. And that the story is still being written. And understanding that is probably going to be the most valuable lesson here. And Anthony Fauci said, you know, I barely listened to those hearings today, but I did capture, I, I did catch a little of what Fauci said at one point. And one of the most important things I think he said is we don't know enough about this in that we, I, right? I think it was, it was during Rand Paul stuff about being humbled and we need to be humbled and, and, and have humility when it comes to moving forward uh, with, with dealing with COVID-19. It's not a normal virus. We're learning about it. In 10 years, we will know so much about this and it will be just a normal virus that cause that may that causes certain conditions, but right now we don't know. And you know, there is a case of a child from Detroit who died of meningoencephalitis, right? An inflammatory condition of the brain. 
There are kids in New York dying of myocarditis, an inflammatory condition of the heart. There are adults all over the world dying of acute respiratory distress syndrome or something similar to that, right? It's essentially an inflammatory condition of the lungs. And there may be other parts of, you know, patients who are, who are having severe low blood pressure may be due to a severe inflammation of the blood vessels. So um, we, we cannot, we need to keep our guard up here. And we need to find ways to live, to live with COVID, get out, right, in society, get the economy going, of course, but um, continue to maintain physical distancing, good practices. You know, Canada is allowing families to come together, you know, one or two, one, or, or like friends, like one or two groups of friends. I think that's, there's some feasibility there if both families kind of have a an agreement that they're going to live up to a certain standard and that's fine right and remember there's a difference between managing your personal life and individual groups of people and how from a public health standpoint we need to manage a population they're two different things right unfortunately right? we know as a population through population health that there are going to be fires all around. And that's inevitable. You're going to have that. And people are going to have those consequences. Kids are going to have that. Adults, young and old. From this individual standpoint, you get to, you have some control and some choice into what risks that you're going to subject your family to and yourself to. You have a choice there. So that's important. From the population standpoint, it's inevitable, right? We know there's, we're, all, we're going to get to our 70% infection rate one way or the other uh, through vaccine or through infections. So uh, I think that's, that, that's really the main thing I want to touch on today. And I, it, the one benefit I hope to, or the one important message I hope to convey in the garbage truck is, uh, is pulling up out in front of my house right now. So it's going to get loud in a minute. You know, the first Facebook live I did was very early in March. And the reason why I did it was because I felt compelled because what I realized is I was following COVID and lots of people were following COVID through February, even early, not in early January, but mainly February. And, and I re and what I realized was that people who, who they, you know, they're not expected to understand these things, right? Like knowing, you know, how population health works and, and in, in infectious disease and public health, or it's not something that you're thinking about every day. And so it wasn't until I realized that uh, this information was really valuable for people that I started doing these. And hopefully there's been some value. We're in that situation again, believe it or not, uh, with this new condition that's coming out with kids. This, everything points to this being a real thing. And if you remember back on March 14th or March 7th, whenever it was, when there was 100 cases of COVID-19 in the United States or whatever number, I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but my point is like, I was in New York City at Mar on March 7th and there was one case of COVID. And that was a big deal. It's like, oh my God, like one case. And then, and then they reached, you know, 100. And that was the milestone. And now, I, I, I mean, I don't, even, I, I don't even pay attention anymore. I don't even know what it is. It's over, it's in the hundreds of thousands, I'm sure, for New York. I don't, I don't even know, uh, right? We're, we're over 1 million in America. We're, we're probably getting close to 2 million by now. I mean, I, I don't even know. It does, 
I don't, I don't pay much attention to that anymore because we know where it goes, right? Like we know the end there. So anyway, the takeaway here is that, like I said back in March, I hope I'm wrong and I hope I'm wrong with this, but I, I don't think I'm going to be. Um, this won't be like a COVID-19, what you see in adults with the, the rates. It's, that would be very different. This is more of a, com probably a complication. And what that means is that you have, you know, out of 100% of kids who are infected with COVID-19, the virus that causes COVID-19, a percentage of those will have this multi-system inflammatory condition, just like a percentage of adults end up having severe pneumonia and severe respiratory disease from COVID-19. It will be an effect or a complication. So it's not like, you know, they get infected, they get this. It's gonna be uh, a, a, a certain rate percentage here. But this is, anytime you bring kids into a picture here, it becomes a whole different beast. And not that older individuals are less valued, uh, but I think when you start applying ethics, bioethics, we know that living lot, like years of life, right? right? Kids have just so much more life years left. And in fact, in 1918, because the influenza was killing young and healthy adults, they were calling it the double death because it was killing, not only was it killing people, but it was killing young people. So it was a whole nother, it was a whole life that they had to live. Um, again, these are going to be small numbers as far as like fractional, like percentage wise, but because there's the rule of big numbers, when you apply these numbers to big populations, um, and, and they're always meaningful, right? Every numerator value is meaningful. Uh, um, so just keep all that in mind. So, okay. I, um, I wanted to kind of, kind of get that out. I wanted to get that out to everyone. I'm not sure. Have people been hearing about this? You probably heard a little about it on the news. I got I got two people on my Zoom call right now, so this is awesome. I mean, I love this. I got Professor Gitre right here. You've heard of this, yeah, Jen, Jen. I got Jen Lee on Zoom. Have you heard of this too? A little bit, not much. Sorry, I'm here. Cool. Oh, okay, great. I got two people on my Zoom call. Oh wait, one sec. Let me just mute this here. I am trying to do some, oh gosh, sorry guys, I don't know if you could hear that. I'm trying to get the, I can't see the comments uh, from the Zoom here, from the uh, Facebook. Hold on one sec, I'm gonna try. Ah, got it. Okay. So I didn't realize there's a lot, there's some comments coming in. So I'm going to address those comments first real quick. And these comments are being posted on Facebook. So, okay. What is the data of other countries opening up? Kevin James. Oh, good, great question. I didn't even think about that. So, okay. South Korea opened up. Now they have a spike in, in infections. All right. Uh, I, I didn't look at it today, but just the other day. Uh, I mean, I mean, it was like, boop, <laughs> it was straight up. And I don't know if you saw, there was just one, there was one guy who went to like five clubs and he ended up infecting about a hundred people. Crazy, uh, super spreader. So uh, you, we saw that there and I think there, we're still getting more data. Yeah, it's inevitable, right? When we, the question isn't, will infections rise when you open up that's not that's the wrong question to ask 
Because the answer to that is yes, okay? The question we need to be asking is how are we going to respond to that? Do we have, and right, we've been pounding the pavement on this. Do we have the infrastructure in place to respond? And the answer is no right now. Uh, we're way behind on this, right? Michigan just talked about, I saw Johns Hopkins is doing a, a course, a free course on be, to become a contact tracer, right? So you're unpaid, uh, volunteering, no experience. I think it's great, right? It's like a volunteer army in a sense, uh, but that's not the way it needs to be, right? This needed to be from day one, a Manhattan project the level of a Manhattan project. If you are not familiar, familiar with that, that was the coming together of American resources in the 1940s uh, to develop atomic energy that ultimately was used for, for a bomb. Um, and it was the, the best and brightest scientists. We need that. We need the COVID Manhattan project. Uh, and part of that is going to be dealing with these, these um, upticks. So that's the, that's the question. It, 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 okay. Hello, Sabrina. Uh, Christy Connie, it's probably too early, but has there been any contact tracing with any of the children? Also with the New York curve going down, is there any science behind why the kids' illnesses is showing up this late in the game? Okay, good questions there. The first part, Contact tracing with children, uh, there has been some, but most of these cases, the parents were infected, or not most, a lot of them, the parents were infected too, so it was a family thing. Remember, the most common way of infection is going to be within families. That We saw that in China. That was early, early information. Anytime you have parents infected who have kids, the kids are most likely going to be infected as well, okay? Um, so I think that's really good, a really good question. And then the second part of this is the New York curve going down, why are cases coming up now? So we're gonna find that out. We, we probably don't know now. I have some hunches, and the hunches are they, it's always been happening. And remember, the, we're blinded. We've been blinded. For the, we've been flying blind in a sense for the last month or two from all these other things that have been happening. People are still dying, right? All these other things are still happening, but they don't make the news. People, right? They get pushed out with the, the COVID, the pure COVID story uh, of infections, right? They get pushed out there. So um, it, it, we're going to find out if, if this, this has been happening. Clearly, one thing we do know is that prob probably kids haven't been, right, dying from this at the rate that that's um, uh, at, a, at, a, at a pretty, at a high rate. But now remember something here. Kawasaki disease, um, right, the, well, let me back up. Just because you don't die from multi-system inflammatory disorder, and hopefully that's the case, that there's very few deaths, you could have long-term consequences from that, right? Sequelae, long-term complications that you don't want either. You don't want kids to have. In Kawasaki disease, you could get coronary artery uh, aneurysms, and you don't want that. So getting over COVID or surviving COVID, there are met, most people don't have, we don't know totally right now, but it appears that most don't have secondary effects, but many do. And so those are the things we're learning. So a lot of this information about kids, it's all new, just like, you know, we, we documented our first cases of COVID in March. We were absolutely having COVID before then, right? So all of this is lagging data. Remember that. It's all retrospective data. And, and therefore, we'll know more in about a month or two. 
but what when you just apply a little critical thinking here if there's a hundred cases there's probably 200 or 500 right there's probably a whole lot more out there so this is just another reason uh to be even more um cautious mindful uh vigilant really out there okay uh hopefully that that was a, a answered your question okay sarah behoff oliver now that i want now that i want children infected or suffering not that i want children sorry uh children infected or suffering but this may actually get people's attention and make them at least wear masks yeah i mean we should be wearing masks anytime we're going to be in public where we're interacting with people like i i don't think you have to wear a mask when you go on a walk around the block i don't think you need to wear a mask when you get in your car and drive somewhere but if i'm going to the grocery store going into the bank right i need to wear a mask if i'm who knows going to my county office to drop off my water bill i need to wear a mask right anytime you're going into a public place with people you need to wear a mask okay uh and this will be interesting on what happens with school and other types of of get-togethers what's nuts is that asia has been doing this for and, and i'm generalizing here right much of asia has been doing this for a long long time you look at any picture in a newspaper and now grand i'm not there i can't see it these are just pictures uh, but everyone's wearing masks. They're wearing masks in Asia. And they're, those countries are dealing the best with this, okay? Uh, Rate-wise, they are dealing the best. So uh, I, I do want to pull back some statements I've made in the past. Now that we have this information, right now at least, about, about a possibility of kids uh, has, having consequences, severe consequences, is that you know the idea of getting young and healthy people out into society without knowing if they have immunity or not is not something I could endorse anymore um, until we know more. That's just how it goes, right? So I I, I would pull that pull that back and and wait. But I I do still stand by if you have immunity. If you've been infected, you have antibodies and that, that react at a good level, strong level, then, then you should definitely, those people definitely need to be out. Okay, uh, wellness checks for children. Uh, Michelle Brown Schwartz, wellness checks for children at pediatrician's offices. I hadn't postponed my, I hadn't postponed my two-year-olds a few weeks ago because he had vaccinations and I felt safe bringing him, but my older son will be turning six in a few weeks so we postpone his wellness visits now. No, no, no. Couple things here that's really important. On one hand, we are now we what COVID will do to public health is set us a decade behind. It's tragic, but it will do that because people are not going and doing the ma basic maintenance anymore of what we or what we normally do. Uh, kids are not getting vaccinated at the same rate that's plummeted and so what you saw what was really interesting is that during the Ebola outbreak in 2016 I think it was because everyone was so focused on Ebola the other the kids in the communities were not getting vaccinated anymore to measles well guess what happened there was a, a tremendous measles outbreak that happened as well. Uh, and that's the same type of thing that will happen here. Uh, we will see this for years to come. It depends on how soon we could kind of get back. If you think about this, and, and something that I think people could grasp and understand is that, right, the consequences to the economy, for anyone who, again, critically thinks about this, recognizes that it's not like one day we ask everyone to shelter in place the next day the economy comes roaring back i think people feel this they know this right this is going to take time like flying on an airplane it doesn't happen the next day 
getting hotels and vacations and those things is going to take a lot of time to get back to the same levels. That's the same exact thing. You could apply that behavior across the board. So if you want to extrapolate that and predict things, that's going to be the same thing with preventive health, right? You're going to have more people in the next five years dying of heart attacks. You're going to have more people dying of diabetes. You're going to have more people dying of things because for the next year or two, no one is paying attention or very few pe less people are paying attention to preventive health. So we're going to see cases rise of things like measles, right? Childhood preventive diseases because people aren't getting their measles vaccine right now. Um, and that's a consequence of us dealing as a population with COVID. So, okay, that was kind of the, the, the premise. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, the preface to, to your question, Michelle. The second part here is we have to live with COVID. We have to figure out how to live with COVID. And so going to your pediatrician's office Right? We, we just keep forgetting that there's an alternative way to do things because we don't see it, uh, because it's not being promulgated in the way that it needs to be, right? And supported. We should all have masks. You put on a mask, if you put on your mask and your doctors have masks and the administrative staff has a mask and the service worker in the hallway has a mask when you walk into that building and everyone is six feet apart, you could have, you, you could inter interact, right? You could get that uh, exam or, or the vaccine uh, or the wellness check. You could do those things. The problem, right? That, that's, that is how you get back into that's how you open up the economy, all right? Opening up the economy, like I said last week, is not flipping your close sign to open, all right? And saying we're open for business. It's implementing an infrastructure, okay? And what's most frustrating to me is that, right, we still are not doing this in how it needs to be. We're getting better. And next month will be better than this month. But, you know, if we want to take this, the, the, the safest approach uh, that's reasonable and rational, uh, this is what we do. You know, we have a trillion dollar stimulus. Just take a fraction of that. And you could get masks to every household, right? I mean, we just sent a stimulus check, right? Uh, ta uh, some tax return, uh, $1,200 or something like that, right? We're, then that, that's great. We, we need more stuff like that. But why don't we send 20 masks to every household? Or why don't we have the U.S. Post Office deliver masks to every household, right? Like, there's things like that. That's a Manhattan project. That is, right, if we could build... Things like the Golden Gate Bridge and the, you know, Freedom Tower. <laughs> we could deliver masks to every household and, and to every person. Like, we could do that. We could do that. Okay. Hopefully that answered your question there. All right. Okay. So, uh, Randy. Uh, yep. Uh, so you're homeschooling your kids next year. Yeah, I think that's going to be a real, a, a real, um, or, or uh, something that a lot of people are going to be doing. Okay, it's hard. <laughs> okay, so guys, it looks like that's, uh, I hit those questions. That was good. Any, um, I don't see, I'm just checking here on Zoom. Anyone else have any questions that they want to put? Uh, here's one, uh, Dr. Frisch, by the way. Anyone in North Jersey who needs an endocrinologist, look up 
Kathy Frisch, F-R-I-S-C-H. We went to uh, medical school together and she is hands down one of the best endocrinologists I know. All right. Uh, do you think there's a, a way summer camps can ensure the safety of the kids if everyone gets PCR tested <laughs> pre-camp and maybe a week or two into camp and no one is allowed in or out? So, right, this is a, so how do we, how do we get camps going, if at all possible? How do we get schools going, if at all possible? Yes, so testing is a bridge to that. And we, here's the deal, right? My last response was, you have to learn, we have to learn to live with COVID, right? So how do we do that? If we want to conduct summer camp, and by the way, my wife, Danielle, who's a historian, went back into old newspaper, the new newspaper archives from 1918, to find out if some, what summer camps, if they opened during the influenza pandemic, and many did, but that doesn't mean we should do that here, <laughs> but many did in 1918 and 1919. So living with COVID, yes, testing is the bridge to do that, uh, but we just need to understand, as long as we understand that if we hold camp, that there will be adults, who get infected. There will be kids who, if this continues the way it's continuing, will come down with multi-system inflammatory disorder, right? Uh, it's the same idea though. What, the, the question isn't, are kids going to be infected or are adults gonna be infected? The answer to that is yes. The important question for camps is, what is the response going to be? What is your plan going to be? What is your quarantine plan? What is your communication plan? Okay. What are you going to do if counselors get infected? And, and do you have someone to take their place? What are you going to do for space, right? Those are the questions that need to get answered. Not should we have camp or not? That's the wrong question. That's the wrong question. Parents will decide whether they want to send their kids. But what would be better if I own the camp is what is my plan? And this should be coming from, this should, these should be national standards, right? Meaning national infrastructure saying, okay, these, these are the guidelines of how you implement it. And then the camps could take over and, 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 and personalize it for their camps. And to answer your question, Dr. Frisch, my opinion is that testing is integral to seeing this work and testing in schools will be integral of making this safe. It will never be zero, unlikely to be zero. I shouldn't say never. It is unlikely to ever have zero infections. It's how do we deal with those infections? Okay, and I saw the fist from Mike and Yana, who by the way, if you ever need an ER doctor in Northern New Jersey, hopefully you don't, but if you do, look up Michael and Yana, one of the best out there. Okay, Shannon Robertson Nolan, what are the symptoms we should be looking for in kids for those? Okay, so the pediatric multi-system inflammatory disorder, it's so, right, we're gonna learn, this is gonna change probably, I tell you what we know right now, right? I remember kind of my first video that we did for COVID-19, right? For adults, right? We had like the five most common. And we'll do that again here, but likely it's gonna change. For kids, it's high, it's high fever. So 102, 103 um, for you know a couple of days. It's redness or conjunctivitis around the eyes. And given that this is a multi-system inflammatory disorder. I bet you're also going to see things like um, fissured lips, chapped lips, uh, anything mucous membrane-y. So the mouth, maybe sores in the mouth, I bet will happen. Um, and so you get the eyes, you get this, you get 
uh, rashes, right? So any type of inflammatory rash, you, you're getting abdominal pain, which I bet you is from inflammation of the intestines, possibly. You're getting diarrhea, uh, which could be inflammation of the intestines as well. Uh, so those, you know, it, it sounds like to me, it's like, a, it's like gastroenteritis on one hand, but then you throw in a fever and you throw in conjunctivitis. The kids look like crap, I bet. Uh, you know, I haven't seen any of these kids personally, but I've seen kids with conjunctivitis, with um, Kawasaki disease. I've seen kids with toxic shock uh, and they look like crap. <laughs> um, so, so the other important takeaway is that if it is important, so in the past, in the last two months, if your kid had a fever and a rash or a fever and diarrhea, uh, you'd probably keep them home. I think it's important to take them to the ER uh, because with some basic blood tests, they're able to tell you'll be able to know whether this is a multi-system inflammatory disorder. And I don't know the time, I don't know the timeline yet on this, as far as like, how soon do kids go from a high fever and inflammation to low blood pressure and hypotension? Because the inflammation is affecting the heart as well, and they're going to heart failure, essentially. So, okay, hopefully that answered you. Christy Connie, isn't antibody testing so much more productive to understand opening things than just tests for COVID? Um, okay, so you, you need both. So you need both testing for, uh, for society for this. Remember, diagnostic tests answer the question, do I currently, right now, am, do I have COVID-19? Am I infected right now? Which means essentially, Am I, you know, it, it, it's not exact exactly, but am I infectious, right? That's the question you're answering also. Serology, have I had COVID, okay? People who have had COVID, who are positive serology, who are protected, they need to get out into society. If we have school, they need to be the ones at school, right? They need to get out. The way diagnostic testing is going to work is... Remember, we will never have zero, uh, right? There's no pure environment anymore. So yes, Mike Pence's press secretary tested negative one day and positive the other, but what they were able to do with that information is to then contact trace, right? Okay, uh, uh, Johnny is positive today. He was negative yesterday. So between yesterday and today, who did Johnny come into contact with, right? Johnny has already been pulled in quarantine. So we eliminate that threat of further infection. Now let's find out who Johnny came into contact with within these 24 hours. Okay, we could find all of those people and we could tell those people, right, whatever the policy is that you need to be quarantined or we need to now watch you very closely or we need to test you now every single day. So this is how public health works, right? It's it's so logical, right? When you keep things together, it's like processes of elimination, right? You identify, you move on, you identify, you move on. And so uh, you need both, right? The diagnostic testing is what allows you uh, to do those things uh, today. Okay. So let's keep going. Nick, Nick Rapsowitz, by the way, you guys ever need a first baseman? Call on Nick. Uh, you know, any major league team need a first baseman. Nick's your guy here. Okay. And, and by the way, I saw Melissa Fiorini. Dr. Fiorini just joined. She was my first mentor in emergency medicine. Just want to give that shout out. And if you ever need a place kicker, Dennis Unger is here. Okay. Next question. I went for antibody testing and results were negative. Okay. This is Harriet Siegel Brown. I was very sick with dry cough, chills, heaviness, and chest end of January after traveling. So I, so the accuracy of these tests, it all just depends on what test you have. But remember, there is no test that is 100% sensitive and 100% specific. So there's always error, right? And you just, right, we're looking for a test that has the least amount of error. So uh, I can't tell you, uh, Harriet, which test you got. But let's just do a little thought experiment here. Let's say the test actually worked 
and it measured what it was supposed to measure. Uh, that could be totally expected, right? Just because you had symptoms of an illness back in, you know, whenever it was January or so, um, doesn't mean you had COVID, right? There were lo there's lots of other things going around, but a negative, but you know, and, and that's the danger of kind of these serological tests right now. It's telling you you were negative. Given this environment though, and given that you felt like you were really sick and it was unusual, I'd probably get retested, right? Wait a month and, and get retested. Uh, but you want to make sure you have a good quality test. You could look up online uh, some of these tests. Now remember, they're only going to get better because what happened was the FDA stopped regulating serological tests and, and like 50 of them hit the market. <clears throat> and now they're back under scrutiny. So we're getting less and less tests, uh, manufacturers out there, but they're getting, we're getting better manufacturers of uh, better tests. So um, we are going to, uh, so yeah, I would just recommend redoing it if, if you're pretty convinced. And, and I think that's going to happen with all of us here with these tests is that, right, we're going to have to kind of do like a maintenance. We're going to have maintenance. We're going to be doing like check-ins, you know, did I convert? Was I an asymptomatic carrier? That, that would be part of the infrastructure. If I were in charge, that's what I would do, right? I would try and test as many people as possible, as often as possible. The problem why we can't do that, number one, is, not is because we don't have the logistics in place for it. Number two, uh, we don't have the physical ability to do that with reagents and swabs and things like that. Right now, uh, that is at least the case. So uh, hopefully that changes, right? Next month, we hope that look, it will look a lot better than, than this month. So hopefully that answered your question. What other questions do we have uh, going on? Ask anything, uh, whether it has to do with, uh, with, with the kids, uh, testing, anything you want right now. We'll tell you, we have, a, we have a handful of ER doctors on this call, I see. So they could chime in as well. If you want to come on Zoom, there's a Zoom link at the very beginning of the comments. Um, Let's see, feel, feel free to ask any questions you have, whatever you want. I've, I've just talked myself empty <laughs> for these last, how long? Oh, wow, we've been going at this for about 45, 50 minutes here. So that's good. Lot, I tell you, there's a lot of good, I think, I think um, some really important points here. So if you're just uh, joining here at the end, circle back around and, and jump on the beginning of this. There'll be, I'll post this, uh, this is uh, being recorded on Zoom as well. Okay, Professor Guitre, our university is talking about face-to-face -face instruction in the fall because the university is producing a large number of virus tests <clears throat> and they claim they can use them to test students and faculty regularly. Besides the issues of overcrowded classes and poor ventilation, I am not enthusiastic about this and wonder how frequently we would all need to be tested for this to matter. So um, I, I don't know the right answer here. I, I can't tell you that. Uh, there are people who have much more experience uh, in planning and instituting these types of systems. Whether it's daily tests or not, um, maybe that's what it looks like. Uh, but we don't know what we don't test, right? So keep that in mind. If we want to really institute a, um, if we really want to open up the economy and do so with the least number of deaths and least number of consequences, testing is your bridge to that, right? It, it's the, it's not the only thing, but it's your bridge. It, it gets you very close. So. Um, but, but we don't have the capabilities right now to do that. We, we don't have the capabilities, hopefully sooner than later. Okay. Um, it's going to be interesting what happens. It's going to be very interesting what happens in the fall. I think 
if I, you know, we are getting uh, a little comfortable here as a country. And I, I think, I, I think, um, <clears throat> I think you're going to see it. Um, we're not going to, to the experience is going to be very different down the line again. You know, it's going to feel a little probably like, you know, March, April again at some point, uh, one way or the other. So, oh, by the way, here's a great, I'm going to post this actually. A real, oh, I posted on, on my Facebook feed already. Uh, so this was really, this was really great for me to just kind of think about. Um, it's called the Stockdale Paradox. So just go, you could, you could just Google Stockdale Paradox and Jim Collins just did a video of this. Um, but it, it was about a POW and how, you know, the optimists who were POWs with him, I think it was during Vietnam, right? They all struggled and had a much harder time and many died when they were, in cap when they were uh, a prisoner of war. And what uh, Admiral Stockdale, he eventually became an admiral, uh, what he said was, you know, he knew he was going to get out. He just kept that hope and that faith going, uh, but he didn't know when. And it was like the optimists would say, you know, in Christmas it, it was going to be better or, or we'll be free. And then, you know, by next Christmas it will get better and, and we'll be free. And that never happened, right? And so they were held captive for many years. And Stockdale... Uh, essentially said, I don't know when I'm going to be free and just accepted that. And that's on one hand, similar to what we need to do now. And it was when kind of, I thought a little deeply about that, that that helped me uh, kind of wrestle with this uh, some more. So, so just, you could go to my Facebook feed uh, and it's there. I posted the video or just find it online. Okay. Oh, I, I see a question on zoom here. Okay. Yep. Oh, I see you posted it. That was Carmen's question. Whoops. Okay. Any other, any other questions? So for those of you, I see there's, there's a handful of people who just joined and I just want to reiterate this, um, because of, uh, um, time, uh, by the way, I want to make a recommendation on a book. It was unbelievable. I'm, I'm reading this. Uh, it's unbelievable. It's called um, Exhalation Stories. Exhalation colon stories. It's fiction. But I, I've been reading it at night. It's just been like an adventure. And it's so vivid and warm and introspective. Really great. The author is Chiang, Chang, C-H-I-A-N-G, first name Ted, uh, the title's Exhalation. So for everyone who just joined, it, it's really, um, I, I think there is a ton of very valuable information that was spoken at the beginning, or at the first half of this video, of this uh, uh, session here, that is uh, gonna be very useful. So next question. Uh, Sarah Oliver, no politician wants to tell people we don't have a date. No one knows that's the issue. This is a long-term nine innings at least or more like nine marathons at least. Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, we're still very early. You know, we're talking second inning, second, third inning of a nine inning game right now, guys, we got a long way to go, uh, for this. So I'll tell you what's really awesome here is I'm seeing people on this call that I've never seen before. Uh, that have joined. So awesome. Ahmad Flager, good to see you. Been a long time. Thank you for joining. I think you said you were a respiratory, right? Respiratory therapist. Uh, I think you mentioned that last time. I'm not sure. Um, so any other questions, guys? We're an hour into this. And, you know, I'll check my calendar once again, see if we could do this for next week. And it looks like next week should be fine. No problem. We'll plan to do it then as well. And if you want, if you want to shoot me any questions ahead of time, 
uh, I could I could do a little research and prepare for that. And um, otherwise, uh, anything else? Look, now you got a, we got book recommendations going on this now. You won't be disappointed. Definitely won't be disappointed on that one. All right. Okay. Uh, we will call it. We will call it a session. Hope everyone recovered from last week's Cinco de Mayo a birthday special session, birthday celebration uh, for my sister Felicia. Hope you guys are doing well with that. And you know, what we tried this time is we did a combo Facebook Live and Zoom session. So if you could go on Zoom right now, there's a link in the beginning of this uh, Facebook Live and you could join if you wanted. You could say hi, feel free. Um, next time, next time, uh, Next time, come on, come on Zoom as well. All right, guys, we will call it a day. Have a very wonderful Tuesday. You guys are very welcome. Thank you for taking the time and joining me. See you later, Dr. Guitre. Thanks, Adam. You bet. You're welcome. All right, guys, talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. Oh, that's right. Jen Lee, I didn't see your face. Just your name. Okay. <laughs> that's awesome. See you later, Jen. Bye. Take it easy. <laughs>